going to introduce Calida. Where is my introduction piece? Yes, Calida, as you can see from her biography, works at Middlesex London Health Unit. And since joining the CLIP project as an advisory member, Calida has made huge contributions to the work we've been doing together. In addition to providing guidance to the project development, Calida has circulated many valuable resources by email, and she's currently part of the planning group for two of our fall learning events. So Calida, I'm passing it to you for your time sharing. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Jillian. When I think about collaborative leadership and equity, intentional inclusion comes to mind as the pathway. And Suzanne did such a great job of introducing the phenomenal CAWI resource on inclusion, a resource I revisit frequently in my practice. Inclusion is a matter of interest to us here at the Middlesex London Health Unit, and our medical officer of health tweeted this image that symbolizes some sentiments around inclusion in London. On the same signboard, this church expresses empathy for the tragedy Muslims face and offers praise to the Pope. Intrinsic motivation that drives collaborative leadership involves suspending judgment, as well as the emotions of humility, empathy, and compassion for the issues and plight of concern to your colleagues, clients, and community. As I've reflected on inclusion of the Middlesex London Health Unit, I've arrived at three key areas for inclusion. And those include inclusive decision making, social and professional inclusion, as well as tying in the concepts uh, to health equity that also address the matters of diversity. And when I think about social and professional inclusion, I particularly think about professional development opportunities and the question of whether equity-seeking groups are included or excluded from opportunities for professional growth. These are some things to think about. And for the concepts that are tied to equity and expanding those beyond the determinants of health, I'm going to focus upon cultural humility here um, in the interest of time. I also conducted an environmental scan of the community to explore a collective understanding and prioritization of inclusion among community service agencies. And when I did that, I was looking for principles of inclusion that were uh, present in the community that may not have been named as inclusion, um, and I regarded those as inclusion in disguise. So I'm just going to uh, click on all these various bubbles so you can see the various ways in which our community refers to inclusion. So there's different types of language for it. And identifying the different ways that one describes inclusion helps us to recognize when we are using different terms to describe a common goal and agenda. And in partnerships, we can refer to this common agenda to help build trust, um, alliances, and synergies. And the black bubbles show the uh, way that we refer to inclusion in our agency primarily, and that's in terms of engagement, collaboration, advocacy, and reaching, having everyone reach their full potential. And that comes with the access to opportunities that then further fosters hope. I also really love the inclusion checklist that uh, Suzanne discussed. And um, as part of my participation on the Brantford Advisory Group for CLIP, we developed an additional question to CAWI's brilliant inclusion list that also helps to trigger one to think of um, the folks that might be excluded in your day-to-day -day work. And that is, consider the population you are representing, speaking for, or advocating for, and how might they be incorporated into this inclusive decision-making process. So that further elaborates on who is not included in the work that you do. And now for um, my favorite framework, and that is cultural humility. Cultural humility enables individuals to transcend, deepen, and improve upon efficiencies of cultural competence um, to further the understanding of culture and diversity. And unlike cultural competence, cultural humility doesn't assume an endpoint or mastery, but a commitment to lifelong learning when considering culture and diversity. So the philosophy was actually developed in the States by an African-American doctor, um, Dr. Melanie Turvalon, and it addresses the role of power and privilege in a system, as well as the imbalanced power of voice and power to make decisions. And uh, cultural humility promotes a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique to understand personal biases and to develop and maintain mutually respectful partnerships based on mutual trust. It involves humbly acknowledging oneself as a learner when it comes to understanding another person's experience. And my colleagues on the webinar have addressed um, that as well. And it also recognizes and mitigates 
and challenges the power imbalances inherent in our service provider client dynamics. It asks us to suspend judgment and provides ways to reduce harm of prejudice and oppression and open opportunities for equity. The, the component of cultural humility that I especially like is that it requires that there be institutional accountability. And our institution has to model the principles of cultural humility as well. And um, just as a little plug, OPHA will be offering cultural humility training in the fall at the Health Equity Fall Forum, November 8th. So that's an opportunity to learn more about it. And I believe that Jillian and Stephanie are going to have links um, in this webinar. And when thinking about inclusion, there's a number of different uh, resources that um, help to contextualize inclusion and uh, let us know how we might be able to implement it into our day-to-day -day work. And so there's a diversity and inclusion charter of Peel. There's a municipal evaluation tool for measuring inclusion in Alberta. And then, of course, the Equity and Inclusion Lens Handbook. Ally, al being an ally, as Suzanne, Suzanne mentioned, is really important. And for further information on that, Mount Sinai has a great campaign with, webinar, with, sorry, with webinars as well as videos online and scripts for being a great ally. Um, also to be inclusive, the Toronto District School Board has a Days of Significance calendar that allows us to recognize um, important days for members of equity-seeking groups. And that's about it. <laughs>